<clears throat> Hello, hi, good evening, everyone. How are all of you doing today? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for joining us today, um, where we're going to speak quite a bit about applications to UK, um, you know, which universities to target, what kind of um, plan should I have in mind, why should I apply, how should I apply, what is the process, what documentation do I need, etc. But before we begin all of that, let me start with a quick introduction. My name is Rashmi. And I have been working with UniHog for the last eight years. I have been working as a trainer and then a senior counselor. <clears throat> and now I take care of the entire admissions team. And I'm hoping that I will be able to answer all of your questions by the time the um, webinar ends. So just to begin, the first question is, um, how many of us are actually applying to the UK? Why are we even applying to the UK? Is it the right destination for me? So before we look at a college application um, decision, before we decide which country, which major, which university, et cetera, um, the first question you should ask yourself is, what do I want to study? And once you decide what major you wanna focus on, the next step would be, where do I want to study? So where do I want to study is actually impacted by a lot of different factors. So why UK, why not US, or why Canada, why not Australia, why not New Zealand, why not one of the European countries? So the question is, what is your eventual goal? Are you looking at an education system that will instill in you um, a lot of confidence, will give you the right set of abilities and quality that allows you to work in that country? Or are you looking at... <clears throat> Um, an education system that gives you a lot of work opportunities or something that is recognized and accredited world over. So depending on the, the main motive or the goal behind um, the kind of education you're seeking is how you kind of decide on the location. The next step is um, once you've decided on a country, then you also want to look at okay, what does this country really offer me, right? Now, if I decide I want to study in the UK, what will it give me? What are the benefits that I'm going to get? Well, first of all, they have an excellent education system, home to uh, universities like Oxford, Cambridge, which are ranked as number one and two across the globe, something that is accepted and accredited worldwide, right? So worldwide recognition and acceptance of these degrees whether you would decide to work in the US, whether you decide to settle down in Europe or even in any of the Asian countries or in the Middle East, any British degree from a renowned UK university is valid across the globe. And it will prepare you for a master's degree. It will prepare you for a PhD. It will help you with your career path, et cetera. The next thing is the high rate of employability. So what is the possibility of getting work or getting job right after your degree. I mean, at the end of the day, the whole purpose of taking up a degree would also eventually be to increase your knowledge base, but at the same time, look for um, you know, a work option as well. So does this offer me some kind of a work placement option along with the course? And that is something that UK does offer. There are a lot of courses which are called sandwich programs, where they give you a year of industrial placement along with your degree itself which actually prepares you with a degree at the end of the four-year course, plus a year of work experience, helping you build your network, helping you to connect with uh, companies which are in your industry and also look for jobs immediately. Plus, of course, you have the stay back option where you will be able to stay back in the country, look for, employing, uh, look for employment and probably eventually settle down in the country as well. Another really unique feature about UK is the duration of the degree. I'm sure that most of you are aware that an undergrad course in the US or in Canada is about four years long, while UK offers a three-year degree, which has the same equivalency and weightage as a four-year undergrad in US or Canada. So why not save a year? Why not use that year for maybe placement options, maybe work options, or maybe even take a gap year if you would like to. 
right? Or actually you could just complete your master's. Isn't that fantastic? Because in the US or Canada or any other country for that matter, majority of the master's courses are two years long, while in the UK, you will be able to finish it in just one year. So four years after high school and you're done with your master's degree as well, and you can proceed into your PhD. UK also offers a lot of fantastic integrated programs where you could do a bachelor's and naturally progress into the master's degree and you get a combined degree at the end of four years or you also have options where you could combine a master's and a PhD course which is about four years long. Scholarships and funding, UK universities are well known for the kind of scholarships that they offer. So based on um, the merits, based on your grades, based on your profile, the universities will be able to offer excellent scholarships as well as financial aid, depending on various criteria. Now, it is really important that we also um, look at which university you wanna study at. So some of the most common and preferred universities are of course, there's Oxford and Cambridge, there's LSE, there is King's College, there's UCL, there are also other popular names like Manchester, Nottingham, uh, Belfast, Dundee, Durham, Warwick, et cetera. Now, how do we decide which is the right university for me? Now, this has to be influenced by a lot of other factors as well. So you wanna look at the location of the university. So is it located in the city? Is it located in a small town? where I will probably have a lot of um, access to the countryside. If you're somebody who enjoys being in, out, out and about in the nature, if you think that that's the kind of atmosphere that you would flourish in, then those are the options you wanna look at. Or are you a city bird? You know, do you want some, do you wanna stay in a place where you have easy access to a lot of different facilities? You have easy access to companies where you may actually find placement as well. Then you wanna look at a lot of universities which are based within and um, near and about of London itself. Similarly, what about the style of education? Is it more theoretical? Is it traditional? So there are many universities which offer the right mix of traditional as well as modern education system. All of them are equipped with fantastic infrastructure. All of them offer you um, extensive uh, library access. All of them provide you with a lot of um, practical experience options as well. Plus you of course have access to a lot of different clubs and activities which students can participate in as well. So depending on the right fit for you, we need to figure out which universities to apply to. And why is it so important that we decide which ones to apply to is also because the number of universities that we can apply to for an undergrad program in UK is limited to five universities only through the UCAS, which is the common application portal through which you would be applying. Now for the application itself, what are the requirements? A very simple um, acronym to remember would be STEER. So the first one is standardized tests. So are standardized tests really necessary for a UK application? Well, there, there are mixed views about this. There are a lot of people who think that standardized exams like SATs or APs are unnecessary or that these are American exams as such. But what we need to remember is as an international applicant, it helps to showcase that you already have achieved a certain level of um, accomplishment with your numeracy and literacy skills, which is what SAT helps you to prove. Secondly, uh, we would also need to supplement this with an IELTS exam, IELTS, which is an English language test. Since we live in a country which is, since most of us live in countries where English is not the first language, um, supporting evidence to prove that you are fluent with the language, an IELTS test would be definitely um, essential in most of the cases. There are certain exceptions, of course, which we will have to check for each course and each university separately. The second step is the transcripts. Now your academic transcripts carry a lot of weightage and importance for any undergrad application, especially UK. And there are certain criteria that we need to meet. Now the criterion and the grade requirements for each curriculum and each course varies with different universities. So it is important that we keep these in mind as we shortlist the universities as well. The next step is E, which is extracurriculars. 
Now, there is a common myth that UK is completely academically oriented and they only look at numbers, and they only look at grades, et cetera. However, that's not necessarily the case. So they do look at your extracurriculars and they do look at the entire profile of the student and the applicant. So what makes you different from every other applicant? How are you different? What other activities have you done? How can we showcase a diversity in your interests is basically what we want to showcase through a kind, the different kinds of extracurriculars that we could engage in. Now, the idea is not to, to work on, you know, 10, 20 different activities just so that you're able to list them and say that, oh, I attempted all of these or I earned certificates or awards for multiple things. But the purpose is for you to engage in activities which you are passionate about. So the first step is for you to identify what am I passionate about? Am I somebody who likes sciences? Am I someone who enjoys interacting with other people? Am I someone who likes um, maybe organizing events? or initiating projects and actually executing them, planning them? Or am I somebody who's technically gifted? So do I enjoy maybe building things or am I artistically inclined, et cetera? Once you identify your passion, you wanna find the right set of activities that will help to showcase your profile in an effective manner. For example, let's say you're an artist and you like drawing and painting. So you take classes for painting and then what next, right? So do I have to participate in competitions and win prizes to show that this is an activity that I enjoy? Not necessarily, but are you able to use your skill or quality to actually add value to someone or add value to society? For instance, could you maybe um, use your skill to promote something? Could you maybe use it to educate some people? Uh, for instance, during the COVID, there were a lot of uh, posters that were created. There was a lot of uh, creatives that were made by people and posted on social media. That could be a way for you to use your art to actually educate people. So there are different ways in which you could actually explore different activities and see how you can present them in the right manner. So the main purpose of any activity that you engage in is the learning that you get out of it and the impact that you're able to make on society. The next one is an essay. Now, <clears throat> as you're aware, as a part of an undergrad application, we submit an essay. And for US and Canada, there are multiple essays that we submit. In fact, we can customize each essay for different schools, talk about specific um, programs that they offer or specific clubs that you would like to be a part of, et cetera. UK, unfortunately, there is only one statement or one personal statement which you actually submit. And this goes to multiple universities, which makes it even more important for you to pay attention to what goes into it and make sure that it is structured really well because you get one chance at explaining and describing who you are to multiple universities. There is no option of customization. There is no option of mentioning multiple programs and which is why your choice of major is also something that you have to decide right in the beginning itself so that your essay can be customized towards that and the shortlisting of universities can also be customized accordingly. And last but not the least, of course, the letter of recommendation which has to come from your school counselor. <clears throat> we would only require one recommendation letter and the main purpose of the recommendation letter is, again, not to list all the awards and activities that you have completed, but actually to also explain how you would add value to the university. So what do you bring to the table? What kind of qualities will you have which will help the university in growing and making sure that the cohort is you know, robust and is supportive of each other? So a recommendation letter should focus on the different skills that you have. It should focus on the learning that you have gained, the interest that you have shown in and out of academics and extracurriculars as well, and everything else that the teacher or the counselor has been able to observe in you as a person. So <clears throat> this is your way or this is um, an opportunity for you to actually showcase your personality and 
uh, my honest recommendation is start speaking to your teachers, start speaking to your counselors and explain and help them understand the different things that you have actually been able to do. Because you must understand that as a counselor, they're probably working with more than 50, 60, 100 students at a time. And it's hard for them to remember or customize each letter of recommendation for each student. But you can do your part and you can help them uh, remember everything that you have done and maybe provide them with something called a brag sheet. You brag a little bit about yourself, talk about everything that you've done. And this can help them to create a letter of recommendation, which is customized and tailor-made just for you, talking just about what you have done. Now, <clears throat> how do we write a personal statement? We spoke about how there is just one essay that we use to submit to about five different universities. So what is the structure that we follow for this? Um, so there are multiple paragraphs that it would basically contain. The first um, initial paragraph needs to speak about your motivation for the subject. So <clears throat> what motivates you to pick up a certain major? So what has led you to decide that, let's say, computer science or medicine or business is my course of interest? Um, the next step is also to explain the background or an incident that basically sparked this interest in you. For instance, let's say you decided to become a physician because you witnessed firsthand um, a case where a physician um, resolved something and you thought that this was miraculous and you wanted to emulate them. Or let's say uh, you saw, um, you know, someone... Um, design a certain product which you thought was fantastic and so you're motivated now to become an engineer or a designer <clears throat> so what is that one incident or a background um, um a stage that happened in your life that basically helped you decide on the program of choice the next step is to talk about what skills have you acquired that makes you feel that this is the right program for you Right. So, for example, you could participate in internships and in observerships with companies, etc., to give you some amount of a real world exposure. So this shows universities that you're a serious candidate, that you have thought through with the major that you want to choose and that you have actually explored this option and you are aware of what it takes to become <clears throat> a good contributor in this field. Then we speak a little bit about our achievements. So these could be extracurricular achievements, such as you know, participation in multiple activities and um, how and what skills you have inculcated over the course of time through these activities. For instance, let's say you're applying for the course of medicine, but you could actually speak about how you're also a dancer or a musician and how this has taught you hand-eye coordination or how this has taught you to be more dedicated or to, um, to focus on a goal. And that these are skills which are actually transferable to your course as well. So any achievement that we speak about, we also want to talk about how these are skills that you have picked up and these are transferable and usable even in your choice of career. The next one is we speak a little bit about our academic prowess. So we want to talk about the grades that we have achieved. Again, not specific numbers, but more in terms of the subjects and your inclination towards a certain subject and how this will <clears throat> um, support um, the, pro the uh, major of choice. So for example, let's say you have an interest in engineering. So sub subjects like physics or math and how this has actually helped you understand some of the engineering concepts through some of the online courses that you probably did. So we wanna talk a little bit about your academic prowess and how you excel in these subjects, which is why that interest again towards that same major. The next step is to speak very briefly about your career goals and what you expect to achieve. For instance, if you have um, an intention of maybe pursuing research programs after your undergrad, or let's say you have, um, an interest in starting your own business or you want to become an entrepreneur or let's say you want to practice medicine and actually help people so depending on what your career goals are you want to mention them briefly and you want to conclude the personal statement with why you want to study in the uk and why not somewhere else so again the last paragraph is not to focus on a comparison between uk and another country but more to speak about why UK, what do you really like about it? So this again goes on to show that the candidate actually has 
done some research, has understood what it takes to actually get there, and has spent time in understanding the process of application completely. Now, some of the most important deadlines you want to keep in mind. <clears throat> now, if you are applying for medicine or if you have applied to the Oxbridge, which is Oxford or Cambridge, then the deadlines are, of course, the October 15th of every year. Um, for all the other majors, you are not too late and the deadline would be Jan 25th. The sooner you apply, the better it would be because these seats do fill in quite quickly, especially being an international applicant. You want to make sure that your application goes in on time. Now, <clears throat> what are extras? Now, this is something that a lot of people are confused about, extras, clearing. These are common terms that you've heard, but you're not quite sure what, what it means and what, uh, how that works. Now, when we apply to the UK, especially for an undergrad course, it goes through the UCAS, through which we're only allowed to choose five universities. But now let's say we receive a rejection from those five universities or that we don't have an offer from any of those five universities, then it allows you to add extra choices. Now these are called extras and you'll probably have to make an additional payment for this, but this is basically what an extra is. <clears throat> now you would receive your decisions and your offers by 19th of May for all the applications that were done prior to Jan 25th. So by May 19th, you will definitely get to know what are the offers you have, what are the conditions you need to meet, et cetera. And by July 5th is when the clearing opens. Now, what is clearing and how is this different from extras? So extras is those five universities that you had applied to, but you couldn't get an offer from. So you wanna apply to a few more. And clearing is basically when um, the universities have already given out their decisions by May 19th, and they still have a few empty seats. Now, not all of the courses are available through clearing, and there are very few courses that are actually available. So you definitely want to keep in mind that clearing is not your first preference. So do not delay your applications and ensure that the application goes through on time. You still have about a month left and it's important that you start focusing on it really well and <clears throat> you complete your applications at the earliest. And last but not the least, um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to address them. If you could please um, you know, post your questions on the chat, I'd be happy to answer them. And also if you could um, please follow us uh, you know, follow, share, subscribe to our social media handles. That'd be great because we do post a lot of informative information on these social media posts. You will find a lot of our upcoming events and um, webinars and all other details, deadlines, etc., on our social media handles as well. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post them on the chat and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Okay, now if you have any questions about master's applications, that's quite a different process actually, because this was primarily for the undergraduate applications. So when it comes to master's applications, your deadlines are going to vary quite a bit and it varies for each university and the application numbers are not limited either. So it's unlimited applications. You can apply to any number of universities and um, the deadlines also vary quite a bit. You could have um, an early action deadline, you could have rolling deadlines, you would have the first round, the second round. So it varies for the program, it varies with courses. So those would be covered on a different webinar. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for your time. 
I appreciate you taking your time to join us today. And I hope all of you have a fantastic evening. Thank you so much.